All right. Well, welcome everyone and happy Sabbath as well too. How many of you are enjoying the the cool weather? <laughs> you know, it was nice, right? And then it, and then when it gets below 40, it's like, wow, this is cold. For us, Darren, for us, okay? <laughs> yeah. Well, why don't we go ahead and bow our heads, have a prayer, and then um, begin with our program tonight. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, uh, first of all, for the Sabbath that has begun, Lord. We ask and invite your presence to be here with us. Lord, I ask that you be with Lee and Margie as they share the message you have for us this evening and anoint their lips so that they may share a message, Lord, that you have worked through them, that you have um, prepared them to share with us, and that we may receive it um, with a with an open heart and, and the message that you have intended to give us as well. We thank you, Lord. Uh, this is your time now. We ask all this in the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. and your wisdom, please come, and Lord, we need understanding, that all that you do is faithful and true, let our eyes see, and let this be a sweet celebration, love's revelation, you are the center of all that we read and all that we need. A song for the ages in these final pages. Teach us the melody sung by a child redeemed. And we will be healed when you are revealed. And we will be healed. Lord, we enter your presence, seeking your face, needing your grace and your wisdom. Please come, and Lord, we need understanding that all that you do is faithful and true at our eyes. See, and may this be a sweet celebration, love's revelation. You are the center of all that we read and all that we need. A song for the ages in the final pages. Teach us the melody sung by a child redeemed. We want to have the kids that are willing to come up, come on up. Margie, do you want them here or there? Where do you want them? Uh, sit right here. Okay, and we'll have the kids sit in the front row, right here. Okay. All right. Here they come. Come on. Yes, right here. Right here. Good, good. Good to see you. Good. All right. Yeah, right here. Yeah. You're going to have fun gonna... shoes again. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I want you to help me say something. Things are not always the way they appear. Can you say that with me? Always the way they appear. Thank you. Good job. Uh, for example, have you ever met somebody and at first they didn't seem very nice? And then you got to be around them for a little more time and you thought, hey, they're kind of nice. I like them. 
things don't, are not always the way they appear. So we shouldn't write people off too soon, right? And sometimes um, things are not always the way they appear about God. There's a lot of people that have been saying some lies about God. They say, he's not fair, he has favorites, he doesn't care about us, and on and on it goes. And is that the way our God is? No, but that's what some people say. And that's the way some people think sometimes. And, and that's not the way our God is. And so we want to talk about that a little bit through an illustration tonight. I have a red sponge ball, just a plain red sponge ball. Now, if you wanted to, you could do some things with that. Like you could put it here and it could be your nose like a clown. Or if you had more than one, you could do um, juggling. I wouldn't do, obviously. I can't even do it with one, so I couldn't do it with many. But Pastor Lee can. Here. Oh, good catch. Okay, throw it to me. You what? You with scarves? Wow, that's pretty cool. Or then another thing is, is I could do something with it to trick you and think, okay, I'm going to put it up in the air and I'm going to count to three. Okay, one, two, three. Where'd it go? Oh, you're just too smart. Well, <laughs> okay, all right, I'm going to do it again. One, two, three, oh, oh what did you see? Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. So, it's here. But I'm going to do something with it. I'm going to put it in my hand, and I'm going to push on it and push on it and just stuff it into my hand. I guess you'll have to wait and see, won't you? Oh, push on it, push on it. <laughs> okay, so which hand is it in now? How did you know that? Did you see something? You saw something red? Okay. <gasps> is that a red sponge ball? Okay. No, it's a red square, isn't it? <gasps> is that a red sponge ball? Things are not always the way they appear. Say it with me again. Things are not always the way they appear. Okay. All right. Just so you know, I did have the real red sponge ball, and I put it back there, and I had this one, which is really cool. You push that black one in like that, and it looks like a, a ball when I bring it out. And then when I'm stuffing it into my hand, it's pushing the black one out into my hand. And then you think it's the red one, but it's really the red square. Isn't that cool? It's a fun trick. But the thing is, I want you to think about Jesus and how people are mis misjudging him. A lot of people, Satan has tried to make it seem like he's not a good guy. But when we get to know him daily, through the Bible stories, excuse me, and talking to him in prayer, we can find out that he is all the things that the Bible says, excuse me, and more. He's all those things and more. He's wonderful. In fact, I'd like for us to take a few minutes right now and just say some words that describe what Jesus is like. What's Jesus like? Kind. Come on, guys. Anybody? Gentle. gentle. 
Compassionate, that's one of my favorites. I love that one. Loving, forgiving, yes. Patient, strong, yes. We could go on all night with wonderful words about Jesus. Does that sound like a guy that doesn't care about us and is mean and nasty and has favorites and stuff? Does that sound like he's that way? No, but Satan on the other end, what's he like? He's a liar. He tells lies. He tries to make people not like God. And let's see, he he wants he knows he's gonna be going down in the end. He's gonna have to die in the end when Jesus comes back. And do you know what he wants to do? He wants to take as many of us with him. Does that sound like somebody you want to get with and depend on and get to know? No. So he's the bad guy, but he's trying to make it look like who's the bad guy? He's trying to make it look like Jesus is. Are we going to believe him? We're not going to believe those lies, are we? And he knew in the beginning when he was going to come to our earth to save us that all these kinds of things could happen that people might not trust or believe. Hey, guys, can you focus right here, please? Um, he knew that that kind of thing could happen. And so he set up ahead of time a series of judgments, four different judgments, where things would happen that people could realize more and more what he is like. And that's what Pastor Lee's going to tell us more about, is these four important judgments that we can know beyond a shadow of doubt. If we know and trust our best friend Jesus, he's going to make it. So, see, because the, there's things are not... Things are not always the way they appear, and that's the way it is in our world, and we want to trust and know Jesus now so that we can know before he comes back that he's the one we want to go with, not with that snake, the devil, right? All right, let's pray. Thank you, dear Jesus, for being our special friend, and thank you for uh, loving us enough to make judgments that would help us know just how you are and also most of all for wanting us to be your friend right now so that we can know you so well and trust you that even when we don't know for sure about some things we can trust the God of the Bible because you've always been faithful and true you've never let us down and we want to be one with you now so we can spend forever with you then Thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right, you can go back to your seats. <laughs> Just before I launch into the presentation, I have to do a quick little kind of what you might call commercial. Um, Marge and I have been traveling doing revival ministry seminars um, for 15 years now, full time. And um, this is a really cool thing. The Arizona Conference of Seventh-day Adventists sponsors us. They give me a paycheck. Marge works for free. They give me a paycheck, but I'm not in the budget. So it's not written into the conference budget, the financial plan for the year, does not include this ministry. So what the conference has said is, we'd like for you to take up one free will offering at the very end of your series. It's wherever you go, one free will offering, and then have the church treasurer of that church send uh, the, the contents of that offering to the Arizona Conference and market revival, and then we'll put it in a special restricted fund we call the revival fund and then they said at the end of every year we'll look and see what's in that fund and if the fund looks like it it could be spread out over another year then we say okay we'll commit to um, a salary for you for the coming year so um, i think it's pretty cool that god has kept this going for 15 years simply by free will offering. I just think it's really cool. And so each year, the conference goes, well, we can do it again. Well, we can do it again. 
So it's not job security because um, I could either retire or I could pastor a church again. So I don't need to do this in order to have a job. But you know what? I'm really excited about revival and renewal. And the reason is because the Bible tells us that just before Jesus comes the second time, there's going to be a great revival, renewal that goes all the way around the world. And I'd like to be part of that, and I believe you probably would too. Now, the reason that we're able to have the seminar here in Tempe is because the churches that preceded this one gave an offering at the end of the series, and those offerings keep it going so that the next church, so to speak, so all I'm doing here at the moment is telling you that tomorrow uh, at the last meeting, which is the worship hour tomorrow, there'll be an offering collected, and the contents of that offering will be sent to the Revival Fund for the Arizona Conference. Margie, maybe you just put a slide up on the screen. If you were going to write a check, some people say, I'm glad to know because uh, I, I'd, I'd like to write a check if I can. And if you were going to write a check, you'd make it out to this church. So you'd make your check out to the Tempe SDA or Seventh-day Adventist Church. And then the treasurer, as I mentioned a moment ago, will forward the offering total to the Arizona Conference Revival Fund. The next slide, I think, tells you that if you were interested in making a, a gift of some sort at a later point in time and not prepared to do one tomorrow, you could always send it to this address. And if you have a smartphone, you can take a picture of the screen. But it's the Arizona Conference. You make a note that it was for the revival ministry because if that's what the note says, it gets put in that restricted use fund, which is simply designated for the series that we do. And that's P.O. Box 12340, Scottsdale, Arizona. 85267. There's another way you can give to that if you want to. You can give, go to our website, allaboutjesusseminars.org, and there's a place where it says donate. You click on that, and the money goes to the Arizona Conference Revival Fund. I think I have one more option, too. Whoa. <laughs> can I see it? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's where I was. Yeah. So anyway, you can also go to the ArizonaConference.org, and they have on the on the opening page, one of the options is donate, and you can click there. And one of the options that you can choose to donate on the Arizona Conference webpage does say revival ministry. They changed it to all about Jesus? Oh, it used to say revival. Anyway, if you click on that, you can do it online too. All right, so I don't beg or twist arms or make long appeals and have soft music play or anything like that because God's kept it going for 15 years, and when he's ready to pull the plug, he'll pull the plug, and until then, it's going to keep going. So, you know, that's how I feel about it. All right, maybe the clicker will behave itself. I'm not talking about the person clicking. I'm talking about the clicker, the piece of plastic. Um, let's have one more prayer. So, Lord Jesus, the book of Revelation, thanks for giving it to us. Thanks for kind of pulling the curtain back a little bit and giving us some glimpses of what we can expect as we get closer and closer to your return. We sure like your return to be soon. We're praying that it is. We're also praying that we can grow closer to you every day while waiting. So please stir our hearts with fresh love and appreciation for you as we look once again into this book for the purpose of seeing more clearly what kind of a friend, what kind of a God you are. Holy Spirit, please open our eyes and ears and rebuke the enemy's power. We don't want him to distract us. So we're asking for that all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So since you saw all of the slides in, in about a microsecond, um, you probably know where this one is because the label was on one of them. But um, this is not that far away, actually. Who knows where it is? Yes, yes. 
Zion. Yep. And if you take another picture here, this is the same rock. The next picture, that's the same rock from a different angle. Does anybody know what the name of this rock is? Okay, well, the next picture will tell you. It's called the Great White Throne. There it is, the Great White Throne. It's a pretty interesting rock from all the different angles and view, but anyway, the Great White Throne is actually mentioned in the book of Revelation. We're not talking about this throne, though. The Great White Throne in the book of Revelation is a completely different throne, and we're going to take a little look, look at what that's all about. But before we take a look at it, I just want you to imagine for a minute that you have gotten to heaven and that you are checking out your mansion, the home you've been had custom built for you by, by Jesus Christ. And you are just astounded by the things you're seeing. It's just amazing. You're just, whoa, I can't believe this is just beyond my wildest imagination. And um, <clears throat> then you step out onto the front porch of your home, check out the neighborhood, right? So you're checking out the neighborhood, pretty nice neighborhood, you're thinking. Uh, then you try to look around back at your house from out, you take a step or two down the sidewalk up to the front door, and you notice your name is in an arch of marble and embedded with gold lettering that's going over the top of the doorway into your house. Whoa, is my name? How cool is this? And then you turn around again on the front porch and you're looking it out in the neighborhood and all of a sudden you pause and you look and you scratch your head and you look again because the name over the arched entrance to the house of your next door neighbor says Saddam Hussein. And you're, am I in the right place? <laughs> and an angel's going by. So you wave at the angel and say, excuse me. The angel stops. And you say, is it okay to ask questions around here? The angel says, well, it depends on your question. What's your question? You say, I'd just like to know how it is that my next door neighbor turns out to be Saddam Hussein. And the angel says to you, oh, that's one of the questions that's off limits. You can't ask that question. Um, but, you know, God doesn't make mistakes, so... You can trust him. Uh, see you later and have a great eternity. Zip, and that angel's out of there. Now, I'm not done with my imagination yet. That's, that's imagination scene one. Here comes imagination scene two. What? Okay, scene two. Before I <laughs> describe scene two, I have to set you up a little bit more. Because maybe there's people in this room or thinking, how do we know what went on with Saddam Hussein in his final moments? How do we know? We know there was a thief on a cross one day beside Jesus. And he said to Jesus, save me, Lord. And Jesus said, I will. So we know it can happen. And how do we know that Saddam Hussein didn't have some kind of, I think they sometimes refer to it as a come to Jesus moment just before he died? We don't know. So in your mind, you're going, okay, so, and we do know that grace is amazing. There's a song called Amazing Grace. So, okay, I'll make allowances in my mind. I'll stretch, and I'll make allowances for the neighbor to be Saddam Hussein. But now here comes scene two. Scene two. For some of you, this isn't going to work. For the row that looks like you're all pretty, you know, I don't think any of you have children yet, right, on that row. Um, so you're going to have to imagine from my scene, too, that you do have children, okay? And those of you who have children, it'll be a little easier for you to imagine this one. Okay, here's scene two. You're standing on the front porch. You've already reconciled yourself to the fact that your next-door neighbor is Saddam Hussein. But as you're looking across the street, you notice the arched doorway over the house across the street. And it's the name 
of the drug dealer that turned your child down the path to destruction. And your child is not in heaven. But the drug dealer who sent them the wrong way is your neighbor across the street. Now, you might have been okay with adjusting to Saddam Hussein, but now what's going on? And there are angels coming by, and you say, whoa, 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 excuse me. Could we ask questions around here? And the angel says, depends on your question. You say, well, I just want to know. Okay, I made allowances for Saddam Hussein to be next door, but what's the deal? How is it that the drug dealer who led my child to hell lives across the street from me. What's that all about? And the angel says to you, oh, I'm sorry. That's one of the questions that's off limits. Can't ask that question, and I can't answer it. I can just tell you, God is wise, and he doesn't make mistakes. So have a great eternity, and the angel's out of here. Now, how are you going to do with that one? How are you feeling now about that one? I think I might say, can you just show me the door? I'm not ready to exit this place. Because if you can't ask questions about things like this, you expect me to trust him when he won't disclose full disclosure? I'm not going to be living happily ever after if there's no full disclosure around here. Okay, you kind of went with me on that imagination, that little trip. Okay, of course, that's not going to happen. But there's a reason it's not going to happen. And it's because of what God's done, how he's planned to make sure that you will be able to live happily ever after. God wants intelligent service and worship. He wants brains engaged. He does not want mindless robots. And that's why... A thousand years is going to be set aside for you and I to be on jury duty. A thousand years. Revelation 20 is the only place this thousand years is mentioned. It's referred to, we refer to it as the millennium. It's never mentioned that word millennium is not in the Bible, but a thousand years is a millennium, and so that's where we come up with that term, millennium. Um, the millennium or thousand year period we're talking about begins with the second coming of Jesus. At the second coming of Jesus, something takes place that's referred to as the first resurrection. And by the way, if you die before Jesus comes, this is the resurrection you want to be a um, part of, the first one. There's going to be another one. You don't want to be part of that one. But the first resurrection, that's the one you're on, you want to be in on that one if you die. Okay, the first resurrection, as Jesus returns the second time, he calls, awake, awake, awake. And all of his friends who have died before he comes, all Christians, all friends of Jesus, are resurrected. It's going to be an amazing thing. We're going to talk some more about the second coming tomorrow during the church service. So then what happens next? There's the first resurrection, the second coming of Jesus, the first resurrection, and all of the righteous, all of the friends of Jesus, go to heaven with him. What happens to the wicked? Well, there's two kinds of wicked. There are the wicked who are alive when Jesus comes, and then there are the wicked who are dead and buried. The wicked who are dead and buried don't come back to life at this time. And the wicked who are alive when Jesus comes are destroyed by the brightness of his glory. So they just, they're toast. They die wherever they are as Jesus comes. So think about this for just one moment. This is a fairly new thought to me. I only had this thought just about a year or so ago for the first time. Um, but it occurred to me that... All of the righteous, all of the friends of God, from now, clear back to Abel in the Garden of Eden, right? 
all of the righteous who have died are going to be resurrected when Jesus comes. It's going to be a mess of righteous. Bunch of righteous. And guess what else? You already figured it out, but it was a new thought to me. I connected the dots and said, oh, wow. All of the wicked are going to be gone. So for this one moment in history, the righteous outnumber the wicked exponentially. It's all there is, is righteous. Wicked are gone. They're done. I don't think the righteous are going to be going, yes. I don't think that will be going like that because I don't think we'll have that kind of attitude. But it's a cool thought to think of. That the righteous are in the majority at the second coming of Jesus. Okay, so then what happens? The dead stay dead. The, the dead wicked stay dead. And the wicked who were alive when he comes, they become dead and they stay dead. And so all of the wicked are dead for a thousand years. At the end of the thousand years, there's what's referred to as the third coming of Jesus. Okay, well, can we go backwards? Here, let me just see it here. Let me let me try aiming. Let me try aiming. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. You guys seen this before? Okay, that's where I want to be. Okay. Not sure what's going on, but weirdness. Yeah, I'm gonna set, I'm gonna set it down like right here, and when I'm ready, I'll push it again, and we'll see if it doesn't mess up with us. Okay, hang on on that one for just a moment. So there's a thousand years that goes by, then the third coming of Jesus. Third coming of Jesus. At the third coming of Jesus, there's going to be what's called the second resurrection. Remember, this is the one you don't want to be part of. You want to be part of the first resurrection if you die before Jesus comes. Second resurrection is all of the wicked. Now they're resurrected for the third coming of Jesus. I failed to mention, during the thousand years that precedes the third coming of Jesus, Satan and his angels are restricted to planet Earth and they are not able to leave. They are basically in time out for a thousand years. They have time to think. There's nobody to tempt, nobody to mess with, because all humanity is either in heaven or dead. So Satan and his angels are in time out for a thousand years. I think that's pretty cool. Can you imagine having to sit and think about what's coming in a thousand years? When I was you know, a little guy, sometimes I would be in trouble. And when I was in trouble, sometimes my mother would tell me to go sit on a chair and I would be in timeout until my father gets home, she would say. So as I'm sitting on the chair waiting for my father to get home, I'm imagining all the things that may happen to me when my father gets home because my parents read the Proverbs. And in the book of Proverbs, Solomon said, it's okay to spank. And my parents believed in the Bible. In fact, Solomon even said something amazing. He said, spank them if they need it, and do not stop because of their loud crying. You will not kill them. <laughs> that's, what, that's what Solomon said. So I would be sitting there wondering if this is going to be one of those times when dad decides that I need to be spanked. I'm in time out, and I'm thinking about what's coming next. And it kind of dominates my, my mind. So I'm just hoping that during that thousand-year period of time, as Satan and his angels have to be in time out thinking about what's coming next, that it's, you know, 
making him a little un uncomfortable. Okay, let's read about it now. I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, having the key to the abyss. That the world is being referred to, the earth is being referred to as the abyss at this point. And holding in his hand a great chain. He seizes the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is actually the devil or Satan, and he binds him for a thousand years. Now, the reason it says he binds him for a thousand years is because he's being restricted to planet Earth. He's not literally in chains. It's just that he can't leave planet Earth. He throws him into the abyss, and he locks and seals it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until the thousand years are ended. Well, they can't deceive the nations because there's no nations to deceive. All the wicked are dead. After that, he must be set free. After that thousand years, he must be set free for a short time. So, during the time that Satan and his angels are in timeout, the righteous are busy in heaven. I believe everybody here intends to be among the righteous. So you're going to be busy for a thousand years in heaven. Let me show you here now, Revelation 20, verses 4 and 5. I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with God, Christ for a thousand years. Did you say it started out saying they were seated on thrones of judgment? So, you're part of the jury. And did you notice it said that those who, have, who were seated on thrones of judgment were people who had died for God or people who had been so sold out to God that he had their minds and hearts, right? And though they, that would be pretty much everybody, then, are the ones who are seated on thrones of judgment. All right, now, next, 20 verse 6. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. So if you die, that's the one. That's a good one to be in. Over these, those who are resurrected during the first resurrection, and over these, the second death has no power. What that means then is that the wicked are resurrected at the third coming of Jesus, but they're not going to stay alive throughout eternity. They're going to die a second time. And the second death, that's serious because there's no resurrection from the second death. It's permanent. Those who were resurrected with the first resurrection, the second death won't mess with them, has no power over them, but they, that group, they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth. So at the same time that says he's released from his prison, what it means is that God has resurrected the wicked in anticipation of the third coming. And Satan tells the wicked he's the one who resurrected them. He, he, he masquerades as the all-powerful God of the earth, and he tells them, it's, I'm, I'm the guy, I'm your man, and he sets out to deceive them one last time and get them ready for battle because his intention is to conquer God and the righteous. This guy's been an idiot for 6,000 years and he's even more of an idiot now because he thinks that he's going to go up against the very one who keeps his heart beating. You think how foolish this is? Like, is you're going to... Okay, anyway... Pardon me? Yeah. He already lost the battle at, at Calvary. But he doesn't get it. And here's why. When you're sold out to sin, you become irrational. It makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense. Think about it. When Jesus was in um, a synagogue, 
on a Sabbath one time. Satan decides to, to, to take over control of the body of a wicked person. So he becomes demon possessed. And then Satan goes into the church with the intent of disrupting the service as Jesus is there speaking. Now, how smart is that? Now, what's he thinking? That he's going to disrupt Jesus? So the demoniac, Satan, in, in the body of the demoniac, comes down the center aisle, screaming and yelling, ranting and raving, and Jesus casts the demon out. <laughs> and the, the demons probably said to each other, I hate it when this happens. You know, whose idea was it to, to take over this guy? What were you thinking? Did you think we had a chance? I don't know. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Well, it was a stupid idea. You know, now we're, we're embarrassed. We've been made fools of. We have to get out of here. I mean, it could have been worse. He could have sent us to pigs. But they're not smart. You're not smart. Sin makes you irrational. The church leaders who killed Jesus at Calvary were told they actually thought they were doing God a favor by killing his son. Not rational. Doesn't make sense. All right, so anyway, I, I got off on that a little bit too much. Let's get back to the verse there. The wicked now. In number, they are like the sands on the seashore. They march across the breadth of the earth. They surround the camp of God's people, the city he loves. So we're in a brief summary. After the second coming of Jesus, all the righteous are in heaven. All the wicked are dead on the earth. Satan gets 365,000 days to live in a cemetery and to think. At the end of that thousand years, the righteous, excuse me, during that thousand years, the righteous are doing what I'm going to refer to as a post-advent judgment. Let's put those three words together and see what that means. Post means after. Advent is the second coming of Jesus. So something post-Advent would be something happening after the second coming of Jesus. And judgment, we read a few moments ago, they were seated on thrones of judgment in heaven during the thousand years. So we call that a post-Advent judgment. And they've been doing that for a thousand years. Then the city of God descends to the earth. He, this is pretty cool. God intends to make our planet the center of the universe. The place where everything went to hell. He turns into the center of the universe. When God wins, it's just so cool. It, he, re, he reverses everything. It's like poof. A couple nights ago, I showed you a picture of Bouchard Gardens. If you were here, it was a rock quarry. Ugly scar in the earth, and now it's one of the most visited gardens on the planet because some people bought it and turned it into a place of beauty. God's going to take the earth that was ravaged by sin and destroyed by both demons and humans, and he's going to turn it into the center of the universe and his headquarters. It's going to be cool. So the city descends. Now, Margie mentioned, if you were with us at the beginning, that God has a series of judgments that he has determined that will enable us to live happily forever after. I asked you at the very beginning to try to imagine how happy you'd be ever after if you couldn't ask questions about people who aren't there. And I think we all agreed that doesn't look like a very good scenario. So God has four aspects of judgment that he has arranged to help us eliminate that problem. Here's the first one. The first aspect of judgment is a judgment that took place at the cross, Jesus atoning for our sin through faith in him. Romans 3 says it this way. God presented him, that's Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement, Pay the price through faith in his blood. God did this to demonstrate his justice. Like he's fair. So as to be just, fair, 
and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. So what is this saying? It's saying God says the wages of sin are death. That's the way it goes. But heaven is willing, the Godhead is willing to take the rap and pay the price for anybody who will trade with them. It's the greatest trade in all the universe. You know, people trade sometimes, trade you this car for that car, or trade you this thing for that thing. You know, if I, if I said to you, if I, if I said my dad used to do this, he, he, used, to, he used to pull a, a pin. My dad was a preacher. There's a pin. My dad, when he was preaching, he had a sermon he entitled, The Greatest Trade Ever. And he'd pull out a pin out of his suit coat, and he said, I just want to tell you, um, I have a pin here. I want to tell you just a little bit about the pin. It's a very nice pin, and he would describe the pin. He writes very nicely, writes in blue, and um, it's got some gold here. It's got a little clip. Anyway, I, I'd like to trade this pin to somebody for a Mercedes. Anybody interested? And people kind of snicker. He goes, no, no, I'm serious. I, I want to trade it for a Mercedes. It's a very nice pen, you know. Um, writes first time every time. It's got a smooth flow. And if you have a Mercedes, I'd like to, you know, trade it. After he plays that for a little while. So. Now, if there was somebody who would trade me a Mercedes for my pen, either they're not very smart or they must really love me. One time he did that at a place and after the service, a guy comes up to him and says, could I have another look at the pen? <laughs> <laughs> Greatest trade in the entire universe ever. Jesus says, I'll trade all of my righteousness for all of your wickedness. I'll swap. You can have my righteousness. I'll take your wickedness. I'll go to the death chamber with your wickedness. You go to eternity with my righteousness. Are you interested? That's what Jesus says. And God says, the cross justifies me. God says, that's the verse here. God says, the cross justifies me in forgiving these people because my son took the rap. So that's the first form of judgment. The second form of judgment that God has put in place is what we're going to call the pre-advent judgment. Now, we a minute ago, we tried to explain what the post-advent judgment meant. Let's just unpack that one. Pre-Advent, so this would be before the second coming of Jesus. There's some kind of judgment going on. And it actually turns out that the pre-Advent judgment, before the second coming, makes it possible for the post-Advent judgment to have the data it needs to process we're going to talk about that third, that post-advent judgment in just a moment. But before you get to the post-advent judgment, you have to have the pre-advent judgment. So what that means is before the second coming, God has kept, he has documented he has documented what people who have accepted the trade that Jesus offered on the cross, he has documented that these people, so everybody in this room, he has documented they accepted the trade. Signed, sealed, sealed, delivered. And they didn't just accept it once. They have continued to accept it on a daily basis. They continue to spend time with my son. They continue. We talked all this week about a personal friendship with Jesus uh, that we nurture, that we spend time getting to know him better in his word. We talk to him through prayer and communicate with him. We tell others what a friend we have in Jesus. We talked about those three legs of that stool. Well, the pre-advent judgment provides God with the evidence he needs to say, these people, I can forgive them because they accepted 
my son's trade. And uh, here's the record. And they didn't just accept it once. They continued to seek my son and to hang out with him. And so that's why I can be just or fair and forgive them. So the pre-Advent judgment makes it possible for God to be just and forgive those who have been forgiven when he comes. Does that seem like a tongue twister or does it seem clear? I hope it seems clear. If it doesn't seem clear, I'm sorry, I'm not doing a good job. I'm trying to, do, I'm trying to make it as clear as I can. But So, so you're, you're going to be in heaven. Now I'll pick on Joshua. So Joshua is going to be in heaven. And the devil says, wait a minute, how come Joshua is going to heaven? I hung out with him some when he was on the planet Earth, and I'm not sure he belongs in heaven. And God says, oh yeah? Well, let me just show you the records we have on Joshua. Here, Here's the date when Joshua and I started becoming friends. There it is. And notice here, I've, I've, been, keeping, I've been keeping a day, a, a, a calendar. And do you see here? From this point forward, do you see... Every day, Joshua and I hang out together. And we've been hanging out together ever since you thought you had him. So, get out of my face. Because he, I'm justified in saving him. There's the record. Here's the, here's the, you want to see it on video? I have a video. You can watch. Here's the video of Josh and I hanging out. And there, it just, it keeps, keeps, keeps going. This is not over in 30 minutes. You can watch the video for as long as you want. There it is. There it is. There's the data. That's the pre-advent judgment. And it justifies God in forgiving who he forgives. Is that, is that clear? Please say it's clear so I can go on to the next one. All right? <clears throat> post-advent judgment. We already defined it. Something that happens after the second coming of Jesus. We've also already explained who's involved in the post-advent judgment. You are. You're going to be going, you're the jury dude, and you're on jury duty, and you're going to be going over the records that were taken during the pre-advent judgment. The post-advent judgment makes it possible for God to be just. Now, this is, try to pay real close attention to what I say next. The post-advent judgment that you'll be doing makes it possible for God to be just and to not forgive those who are unforgiven. Because, if my son is not there, or if my daughter is not there, or if Saddam Hussein is my neighbor, God is going to say, here's the records. Go over them for yourself. Take a thousand years if you need to. Satisfy yourself that everything that's been done has been done fairly, Honestly, openly, no hidden agendas, no secret trades, no under-the-table deals. Everything's been done. And you're going to be able to see that God is justified in not forgiving the people who didn't want forgiveness. Is that clear? That's what the post-advent judgment is all about. You see, God for God, it's important to Him that we judge him and how he dealt with those who aren't saved. It's important. God wants us to see how long-suffering he was, to see how many extra miles he went to try and redeem people who aren't there. He wants those who are saved to completely satisfy themselves that heaven left no stone unturned, that they went after those those who were lost over and over and over again. They gave them opportunity after opportunity. They pled with them. They 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 worked with them. They urged them. They pleaded with them. They they yearned for them. They they gave them all kinds. Of... He wants those who are saved to see why those who aren't saved aren't saved and to feel okay. I'm sad. My son is not here. I am heartbroken. My son is not here, but I can see that the reason he's not here is no fault of God's.
two elections back, you might remember. There were 50,000 missing emails. How convenient. The 50,000 missing emails just happened to be emails that had incriminating evidence. And it was such a pity that that hard drive went down the drain. You know? no, nobody could explain how it happened, but it just happened that the very hard drive that contained all the incriminating evidence for one of the presidential candidates, it just vanished. And it's like, go figure. I mean, it was a bad day at the office. We lost it all. And half of the American public said, oh, we believe that. Yeah, we believe it. Too bad that the hard drive crashed. That's not going to happen with God. Because the other half of the American public said, very convenient that that one, that one went down. Looks to us like it went down on purpose. Looks to us like you knew it would nail you and you made sure that the evidence was destroyed. That's how it looks to There are no missing emails. You have full disclosure. You can ask. You're going to get the truth unvarnished. You're going to see for yourself. And when you're done, you're going to satisfy yourself that heaven did it there. If that wasn't possible, if we couldn't do that, we wouldn't live happily ever after. Because we'd have gnawing doubts in our head. But how come? So how come he's not here? How come he's here? Well, you can't ask that question. It's off limits. No, there's not going to be any off limits questions. God's the one who said, come, let us reason together. He's the one who says, full disclosure. I want you satisfied that you're on the right team when you're on my side. That's what he wants. He wants you satisfied. Well, that brings us to the fourth one. The white throne judgment. This one takes place from the great white throne and it's not in Zion. National Park. Revelation 20. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And I saw the dead, great and small. So now they've been resurrected before the throne and the books were opened. So, okay, we're going to open the database. Here we go. And all of the unrighteous are there. And here's all the records. Back in the day when I was in college, they called it microfilm and microfish. That's obsolete now. The books were opened. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. If your name is written in the book of life, and anybody who's friends with Jesus has their name written in the book of life. If your name is written in the book of life, you're good to go. If your name is not written in the book of life, you're thrown into the lake of fire, and it's the second death. And by the way, and we're not going to take a long time on this because it's, it's not part of our presentation tonight. But it's over. It doesn't go on forever. The second death happens, and then that's it. It's over. And in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, when it says that the fire, the smoke of the fire ascends forever, what that's trying to say in Scripture is that it's permanent. That's what it means. It doesn't mean that the smoke just keeps going and going forever and forever and the flames just keep burning forever and forever and the people who are in the second that lake of fire are just burning forever and ever. No, it's over forever. They're, they're consumed and it's over forever. But before the fire, this is really interesting what happens. Every detail 
of the great controversy between Christ and Satan. The battle, the cosmic war that's been going on. Every film in Hollywood and pretty much every book has a hero and a villain. And the hero and the villain are just miniature versions of the great controversy. There is an ultimate hero and an ultimate villain. God is the ultimate hero. Satan is the ultimate villain. And every detail of the great controversy is going to be replayed with surround sound. And the entire, everybody who has ever been born, everybody who has ever lived, is going to watch the movie. Now, I'm using the word movie as a way of just trying to make it clear to our minds. I'm sure God has much more advanced ways of dealing with it than a movie. But the entire universe will be the theater. And everyone who's ever lived will be the audience. And it may take 6,000 years to watch. I'm just guessing. Because we've had 6,000 years of history. It may take 6,000 years to watch. Um, but it won't matter how long it takes to watch because time will be no more. So nobody's going to be concerned about time. But everybody is going to see their part in the movie. And they're going to see where, where they either rejected Jesus for the last time or accepted him and continued to. They're going to see it. And everybody's going to see Calvary. And everybody's going to see Gethsemane. And everybody's going to see the devil doing everything he can to kill God. They're going to see how despicable and how utterly unfair and how dirty he played. Everybody's going to see it. And once the movie is over, once again, I'm borrowing the metaphor of movie, but just play it, go with me on that. Once the movie is over and the credits are rolling, there will be no unanswered questions. Every single creature with intelligence will understand completely the issues in the great controversy between Christ and Satan, and they'll see how Satan was the jerk and God was the hero. Everybody, including the wicked. Including Satan himself. And we're told that when the movie finishes, and God takes front and center, and the spotlight comes down on Jesus, that Satan and every one of the wicked will bow to their knees and they will say before the onlooking universe, God is fair, God is just, he played the game honestly, we were the ones out of sync. He was on his game. He deserves worship, he deserves praise, he is honorable, he has never done anything wrong. The wicked and Satan himself are going to say that before the entire onlooking universe. And we're told that a great white-robed multitude is going to break forth into singing with a loud voice. And this is what they're going to sing. A song that has these words in it. Salvation to our God. Notice it says salvation to our God. It doesn't say salvation from our God. It's not talking about our salvation. It's talking about his salvation. What's that? He's finally been vindicated before the entire universe. He's finally been shown to be who he is. Loving, fair, honest, compassionate, true, faithful, long-suffering, on on. He's shown. And no more is anybody ever going to be able to say about him bad things because he is now salvation. Yes, they're going to say, salvation to our God. 
He stands vindicated. There are no more questions, no more accusations. He wins. He wins. You can see why they'd be singing. They're going to be singing. His reputation has been cleared forever. And the reason that they're going to be able to sing with so much fervor is because they spent a thousand years going over the records, convincing themselves every question answered, every detail, no missing emails. So they can sing with their whole heart. So 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says, therefore, there's just going to be this great white throne judgment one day. And everything's going to be straightened out then. So Paul says, therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. In other words, so you quit sitting in judgment on anybody else. Wait till the Lord comes. There's a judgment coming, and you don't need to judge in advance. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness, and He will expose the motives of men's hearts. So what that's saying is there's coming a time where God's going to show, you're going to have like x-ray vision, so to speak, and your God's going to show you what's been going on in men's hearts and in women's hearts. He's going to show you. And this is what's going to happen at that point. You're going to discover some amazing things. You're going to discover that some people who you thought were the cream of the crop are actually at the top of the dirt pile. You're also going to find that there are some people who you thought were the dirt who are actually at the top of the gold pile. And the reason that the great reversal will take place and become apparent is because at that point, God shows you what's been going on on the inside. You know what it says in the Bible? Man looks on the outward appearance. The Bible says, where does God look? On the heart. Which means that God sees what we don't see. And that's why Paul says, so quit judging people. Because you don't know. Sitting right here beside my wife, Margie, is her sister, Mary, and our brother-in-law, Bo. And one time, we were sitting at their home over a meal, and we were talking about some people who we deeply cared about, whose lives appeared to be going down the wrong path. And Bo made a comment that Margie and I have never forgotten. He said, Our understanding of what's really going on in their hearts and in their lives is muddy at best. In other words, all we can see is outward stuff. We don't have a clue what's really going on. So it's not right for us to say, well, they're, they're going the wrong way. Because how do we know what's going on between them and God? How do we know? It's muddy at best. Sometimes a pastor is asked to do a funeral service for somebody who committed suicide. And there are people who will come to a funeral of that sort and after the service is over, they will say to the pastor, oh my, that must have been a really hard service for you to do. Now, what they're really saying is, this is like between the lines, what they're really saying is, we all know that one of the Ten Commandments says, thou shalt not kill. And we all know that they killed themselves. So they broke a Ten Commandment. And we all know that they didn't live after they killed themselves, so they couldn't ask forgiveness for that sin that they broke the commandment and killed themselves. So therefore, since they couldn't ask forgiveness for the sin, we all know they're lost for eternity. And then you come here and have to do a funeral and try to make it comforting. But the truth is, we all know they're not going to heaven. They're lost. That's the unspoken thinking going on when the person says, this must be a very hard service for you to do. But I have news for those people. Who am I to determine 
what was going on in them, in their mind. Who am I? Who am I to know what kind of baggage they were carrying? Who am I? It's not our business at funerals to determine people's eternal life or destiny. It's not our business. Only God is in charge of destinies. And God knows hearts. And here's a verse I want you to consider. I don't have it on the screen, but I'll read it to you. It's Psalms 34, verse 18. Listen carefully since it's not on the screen. The Lord is close to those whose hearts have been broken. Now let me ask you a question. What is a suicide if they're not a broken-hearted person? Huh? Right? It keeps going. It says the Lord is close to those whose hearts have been broken. And then it says this. He saves those whose spirits have been crushed. What's a suicide if they're not a crushed spirit? Right? So what this tells me is God is not hindered by our judgment as to whether they should or shouldn't be lost. You know what I'm saying? He's very close. And when someone's taken themselves out, guess who's the one who's the closest with them right there at that moment? Jesus. And he knows why they're there. And he knows the baggage that they've been carrying. And he knows how they got the baggage and how, how it was dumped on them, how they inherited it, and how they had no control of it. Gideon, back there at the back, he works with um, children who are abused. I think that would be just about the hardest job in the world. And he is privy to some of the most horrifying things that are done to children. And he's there to try and help the children. But some of those children have had things done to them that are so horrific that those children are never going to to come out on top. They're damaged forever until the second coming. And a child who's been damaged forever by a thoughtless, demonic adult, that child may do some really crazy and stupid things. And people looking on might say, well, there's a hell raiser. There's a kid headed for hell in a hurry. But God knows the heart. And God knows how they got there. And he knows what happened to them. He knows even more than Gideon knows about the sad stuff. And he sees them doing things that the world punishes them for. And I think God says, I've still got you. Everyone else might think you're gone, you're done, you're toast, you're finished. But in my great heart of love, there's still room for you. You didn't ask to be treated the way you were treated. So the point here is, Corinthians said, don't judge prematurely. Because there's a judgment coming. And God's going to show what really went on. And when he shows what really goes on, if, if Saddam Hussein is my next door neighbor, when God shows what really goes on, I will be okay with it. I'm not saying he will be. I'm just saying if he is, I'll be okay with it. Because God will show me what really went on. Here's my last story. Yeah. Thank you, Margie. See, that's part of what the thousand years is about. You're on jury duty. And you're discovering what God's been doing. And why people are there that you didn't think would be there. And why people are missing who you were sure were going to be at the head of the pack. To be able to understand it all. Because God set up these judgments 
so that all questions will be answered. My last story. Um, before I was a pastor, I taught at Seventh-day Adventist high schools, and I was the Bible or religion teacher. So anyway, one day I was standing in front of the, class, uh, in front of the administration building just before the beginning of the first class of the day. And I was standing with the vice principal, a woman who was, and I were just standing off to the side, on the sidewalk. Um, all the kids, of course, are rushing in to get to their first period class before the bell rings so they don't get tardy. And then the bell rings, and there's nobody left in the halls. And as we're standing out there, just talking, a girl who is a junior at the high school, so she's a, a, a 11th grader. She comes driving in in her car, and she pulls into a parking place that has a sign posted right at the front of the parking place. The sign says, faculty parking only, no student parking. And she parks right there. <laughs> then she gets out of her car, slams the door, and starts walking into the building. As she's walking into the building, the vice principal says to her, Sweetheart, you need to move your car. That's not student parking. The sign says faculty only. I need you to move your car. And she said to the vice principal, you aren't going to tell me what to do. I'll park my car wherever I please. And you're not going to have a thing to say about it. Deal with it. And she walked on into the building and went to her class. And I looked at the vice principal. And I was like, you know? You're going to let that go by unchecked? Sick him! Get her! That's just rank rebellion. You're not going to let her get away with that. Vice principal ignores it. Just ignores it. I'm thinking, Phew. well, maybe the vice principal doesn't know how to deal with rebellion or rebels, but the Bible teacher knows how to deal with rebels. It was the last quarter of the school year. And from that point forward, if this girl came into my classroom while the tardy bill was ringing, I marked her tardy. Because I knew how to deal with rebels. And when I'm computing up the grades, if she's one point away from an A-, minus, I gave her a B plus Because I knew how to deal with rebels. Maybe the vice principal didn't know, but I knew how to deal with rebels. Well, the school year finished. And after the school year, every year at that high school where I was teaching, all the faculty had to meet. They called it post-session. I will call it now post-advent judgment. And what the faculty did is they sat around the table and the registrar would read the name of every student who had asked to be able to come back to the school in the next year. Obviously, the seniors have graduated, but any student who had indicated they wanted to return for another year, their names are in the application, so to speak, forms. And now we go down the list. The registrar reads the name. And if any teacher around the table has a concern about the name that's just been given, that teacher is supposed to say, uh, could we speak for a moment about Lee Venden? You know, uh, I have a concern about him. I had this incident. I had this incident with him. Um, and then we would talk around. Come on. I don't know what's going on. Let's see if we have. No, we're going back. No? Well, I still have my slides, so I don't know where that noise is coming from. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, there's an enemy. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Let me finish my story, okay? So you can go. <laughs> so you get the idea. They go down the list of names. Anybody has a concern, you say something. And after talking about the concern, Faculty say, okay, well, let's let him come back, but just tell him we have a concern and make him aware that we want to make sure that we don't have that kind of trouble in the future. And Or we have no concerns. Welcome him back. No problem. No strings attached. Well, I'm looking at the list, and I see where that girl's name is. So I'm ready. Look at that. It just happened again. 
We'll play tug of war, Pastor Mike, you and me. Uh, you, it goes from your side, I'll put it back. You, now you can go that your side, back and put it, I'll put it back. We'll just keep. <laughs> so when the girl's name came up, nobody said anything. I looked at the, I looked at the vice principal like, you know, she didn't say a word. So they started to go to the next name. And I said, excuse me, I do have a concern about that name. Then I told the story of what I had seen her do to the vice principal. And I said, it seems to me that kind of rebellion ought to be addressed. And the vice principal said, maybe I should speak to this. And I thought to myself, yeah, you should have spoken to it a long time ago. And this is what the vice principal said. She said, I waited till the class period had been going on for a little while. And then I went into that classroom where she was. And I came around from behind, tapped her on the shoulder quietly, and asked her if she'd please come with me to my office. So she came with me to my office. She said, in my office, there are two chairs on one side of my desk, and then there's my desk and my chair. The two chairs are on either side of a little lampstand. And he, she said, instead of sitting behind my desk, I sat beside her on the two chairs. Then I turned to her and I said to her these words. I said, honey, there must be some really bad hurt going on inside of you right now in order for you to have exploded the way you did. Do you want to talk about the pain? And she said the girl burst into tears. And the girl said, my father this morning was telling my mother and myself and my siblings that he is never coming home, and if he ever sees us again, it'll be too soon. He doesn't want anything to do with me. He doesn't want anything to do with my sisters or my brother. He doesn't ever want to see my mother again. He was chewing us out. He was cursing us. He was packing to leave, and he said he was never coming back. She says, my heart was breaking. I tried to get him to interrupt his flow by telling him I needed to go to school. And he turned on me and said, don't you ever interrupt an adult when they're talking. Don't you know adults are an authority over you? You are not an adult. And until you are an adult, you have no authority. You respond to the authority of an adult. Now you shut up. She said, weeping, I went and found the keys to the car. I cried all the way to school. And when I parked my car, I wasn't even paying attention where I parked. There were so many tears in my eyes. I got out of my car, and the first thing that I'm told is an adult in authority tells me. And she said, I lost it. And she said, I was wrong. I'm sorry. And if you want to give me some sort of discipline, I'm okay with that. I deserve it. And I'll move my car. And when the vice principal finished telling her story, the Bible teacher thought to himself, woe is me. I am undone. I am a Bible teacher of unclean conclusions. Because, see, I didn't know the heart. I judged her by what I saw. The vice principal got to the heart and decided that there were bigger things going down. Here's one of the rest of the stories to that story that makes me even have a harder time with it. 20 years later, Margie and I did a seminar in... Omaha, Nebraska, that girl who was in her 40s at this point drove over an hour across town to come to our seminar. I saw her. I recognized her. And here's the part that really got me. At the close of the seminar that night, she comes up to me and she tells me that I was her favorite teacher. <laughs> Talk about coals of fire. She tells me I was her favorite teacher and I felt this big. And I started to cry. I, I told her the story of what I'd done. And I asked her, I was crying. And I asked her if she could forgive me for something she never even knew. 
but I confessed it, and I said, can you forgive me? I'm crying, <laughs> and she puts her arms around me, and she puts and pats me on the back of my neck, and she goes, I forgive you, Mr. Venden. <laughs> God loves us, and he wants us to be happy forever. And that's why he set up the series of judgments, and that's why it's a good thing, not a scary thing. A judgment is nothing to be afraid of if you're a friend of Jesus. Nothing to be afraid of. And it's because of those judgments that one day we're going to be able to sing a song that has these words in it. Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just, that's another way of saying fair, just and true are your ways, O King of Saints, who will not fear, that's revere, you, O Lord, who will not glorify your name, for you alone are holy. For all nations will come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. We've seen it for ourselves. And now we can live happily ever after because you didn't hide anything. 2,000 years ago, a baby was born to die for the guilty so that all who are on the J team need not fear judgment. Check this verse out. Jesus talking in John 5, 24. And this is what Jesus says. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. Jesus says, if you join my team, you're going to live forever. He goes even further. And that person shall not come into judgment, but has passed over from death into life. You're not even going to come up for judgment if you're friends with Jesus. And so imagine this scene. Imagine this scene. Great white throne judgment. The registrar reads your name. I'll just pick on myself. Lee Venden. And a guy in a white robe steps forward. And he raises an arm. Sleeve drops down. Powerful forearm from a guy who looks like he spent a lot of time working with wood. And that guy says... Lee Vanden's a friend of mine. I told him he wouldn't have to be here for this because I'm standing in for him. Don't even have to be afraid of judgment. All right, our closing song, and then we'll let you go. Here's the closing song. Before I play it, though, I just want to set it up for you just a moment real quickly. This story, this story is about Mary Magdalene. And you remember Mary Magdalene? The one who was thrown at Jesus' feet. Right? And they wanted to stone her. Okay? And she's coming back to the tomb on Sunday morning because she wants to be where Jesus is and she wants to bring fresh ointments because she wants to embalm him further. You know the story. It's in the Bible. But as she's approaching the tomb, she's thinking to herself on Sunday morning that they have a stone across the front and there's guards here. How am I ever going to get to Jesus? Who's going to roll away the stone? Wait a second. Time out, same girl, different scene, the song. There's two songs on this one, and I started to describe what happened in the second song. This is the song. Same girl, same girl. She's thrown at the feet of Jesus by the church leaders in this song. She's thrown at his feet. And they say to Jesus, so the law of Moses says she should be stoned to death. What do you say? You remember Jesus looks at them? Well, in this song, which is a buddy hoteling song, they say to Jesus, you know what kind of woman this is? Do you know who she is? Do you know who she is? It's really cool what Jesus does. He goes, yeah. Yeah, I know who she is. 
I know who she is. She's the one who's going to anoint my feet. She's the one who's going to be the last one to leave the cross when I am on it. She's the one who's going to embalm me at Joseph's tomb. She's the one who will be the first, the last to leave the tomb on Friday evening. She's the one who will be the first at the tomb on Sunday morning. Yes, I know who she is. It's this is really cool because... Depicts what I'm trying to talk about here. God sees the inside. So here goes the song, and then we'll let you go. Covered 
with a bun of cheese on What can make me white as snow? Only one thing that I know. Covered with the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you have things in place so that your friends will be able to live happily forever after. Can't wait to be part of the group that sings, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Thank you for being interested in everybody in this room. Thank you for knocking on our heart, saying, hey, can we have fellowship together? Can we hang out? And thanks for promising that if we respond to that knock, you will see to it that we don't even come up for judgment. Good news, Lord Jesus. We thank you for it in your name. Amen. Tomorrow, 8.30, for those of you who are willing to get here that early, there's going to be breakfast. And they'll serve it till just before 9.30. Then at 9.30, we're going to do the next one in our series, which is going to be, we're getting to the very end of Revelation, and oh man, the back of the book is incredibly wonderful because we get to go home. That one's called Turning Point. It's coming. Turning Point. And then the final one is the 11 o'clock hour, and that one's going to be about going home. So turning point, going home, breakfast if you want it, and that's the deal. See you tomorrow. God bless you.